This is my kind of audience. I'm not even the one who's, you guys are here for tonight. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Marissa Levine, director of Inforum and Innovation Lab at the Commonwealth Club. And I'm probably maybe as excited as you guys are. This is a pretty excited audience to welcome you to tonight's program with Tim Ferriss and Naval Ravikant. There's no applause for Tim? Hey. Now, we all know Tim from places like the Four Hour Everything his blog, or his incredible podcast, but tonight we're here for his latest, Tools of Titans. Tools of Titans, I've been weightlifting with it. Um, it's pretty hefty if you've already picked up your copy, we'll have more on sale after the program. And what's fun is usually Tim is the one interviewing some of the most fascinating people in the world. But now, Naval Ravikant, CEO and co-founder of Angel List, gets to turn the tables. Naval has been the guest on Tim's podcast not once, but twice, and even has his own chapter in the book. Now, I also think everybody here is just as fascinating as the people that Tim interviews. So take a second, this is a long-winded group, to turn to your neighbor and say hello. You never know who you might meet at Inforum. <laughs> and that's enough. You've made more than enough introductions. You can continue the friendship afterwards. Perfect. There are bars in the Castro for you after the program. There we go. Now tonight, tonight is one of just 450 programs like this that the Commonwealth Club produces. But that's a crazy feat that can't be accomplished without our incredible community. That includes attendees, members, supporters, donors, volunteers. And we would love to have you join us as one of those, even beyond attending our program. So see any of us with a name tag to get more involved. We're also excited to announce that we'll be moving into our brand new home at 110 The Embarcadero uh, later this spring, uh, so get excited. We're one of the few nonprofits in the Bay with a view of the Bay Bridge from our new roof deck, so come get involved. Other great programs coming up include an SF Beer Week event on Valentine's Day with folks like Anchor, Local, Fort Point, and Magnolia. Designing Your Life with Stanford professors Bill Burnett and Dave Evans on March 15th. And an impact investing program with Nancy Fund on March 21st, just to mention a few. Now, you might know if you checked the Facebook event or StubHub tonight, but we are very sold out. To help out your friends who couldn't make it, we are live streaming on Facebook. I think my face is on there right now. So go on Facebook and share the post from Inform at the Commonwealth Club for anybody who missed it. Now, at the end of the conversation, we'll be taking live questions from the audience, but here's how live questions work so that we get to do this again. Live questions, about 15, 20 words. No personal stories, no sales pitches for Tim. I think he and Deval will make fun of you and cut you off. So keep your questions short so that everybody else can ask them. You'll hear a reminder in about, that in about five minutes we'll start questions, so start thinking, and then raise your hands and our staff will come to you with a microphone. Now tonight, we also do not ask you to turn your phones off, but those ringers must be off or we'll all be laughing at you. So ringers off, but feel free to tweet. We are at Inforum SF. Tim is at T. Ferris, and Naval is at Naval. I always love those people who get their first name as their Twitter handle. Uh, so join us, all of those handles are on the screen behind us, and jump into the conversation. We also like the hashtag Inforum SF. And now, what you've all been waiting for, even though I got the cheers, is my pleasure to introduce Tim Ferriss and Naval Ravikant to the Inforum stage. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. It's a great turnout tonight. Uh, so welcome to tonight's program with the Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Naval Ravikant, and I'll be uh, hosting Tim Ferriss here. I'm the founder and CEO of AngelList, and I've been a guest on Tim's uh, incredible podcast twice now, uh, which is now at, what, 125 million downloads or something like that? 125, yeah. 130 million now. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to start a podcast too soon, so <laughs> just uh, keep an eye over your shoulder. Um, <laughs> Got to so, run my own race, man. Got to run my own race. <laughs> so, you all know Tim Ferriss, and you're all here from him, uh, but I still feel obligated to do the bio introduction. And as part of that, I started preparing for the biography, and I had to cut it down and cut it down and cut it down and cut it down. So I've gotten it down now to about half a page. 
um, and I'll try and fly through it, but he has been uh, described as this generation's self-help guru, which I think is, doesn't even begin to do it justice. He's self-described as a professional dilettante and a human guinea pig, which if you've seen his TV show, you've watched them do horrible things to him. Um, he's a best-selling author, of course, The Four-Hour Workweek, and no, he does not work four hours a week. Uh, <laughs> or if he does, it's at 20 different jobs. Uh, the Four-Hour Body, The Four-Hour Chef, and now Tools of Titans, a 700-page tome, which I think you've all seen that just distills wisdom from everyone from Arnold Schwarzenegger to Maria Popova. And uh, it is, I would say, this generation's uh, go-to book for learning how the previous generation succeeded. Um, he's, a, he's also a kickboxing champ, a world record holder in tango, although those are dated. I, I wonder if those you can still dated. do it. Those are dated. Those are very dated. Yeah. He's a uh, hack. just old and bald and fat now. <laughs> <laughs> Happens. He's hacked learning skills. Uh, he's learned jujitsu, multiple languages, surfing, drumming, Japanese horse horseback archery, uh, acro yoga, parkour, uh, all kinds of crazy suicidal physical stuff. Uh, and he did a brief stint as an investor uh, and advisor, during which time he invested and advised uh, Uber, Facebook, Alibaba, Twitter, Shopify, Ship, Evernote, StumbleUpon, and then he dropped the mic. And, uh, <laughs> Very publicly uh, resigned from the business, retired from the business uh, at the ripe old age of what, 38, I think, was when you, when you quit uh, that un unprofitable line of work. Um, so when I started stitching this giant biography together, and I had to cut and cut and leave out parts of it, the immediate thing that came to mind is, how screwed up must your childhood have been <laughs> to drive you like such a madman? <laughs> So just, I'm going to get to that, but as context, I wanted Naval to do this because A, I knew he would bust my b uh, B, very smart, and I have no idea what he's going to ask me. So I'm coming That's true. Wise. I tried to offer him the questions and he would not look. <laughs> so it could be an interesting evening. And thank you everybody for coming. This means a lot to me. I've always wanted to do an event here in my hometown. So thank you all very much. So as to my maladjusted youth, I would say that uh, I suppose the, the obsessive experimentation and whatnot really began with my being born premature. So I have thermoregulatory issues even to this day. I've been hospitalized for heat stroke multiple times. And that led to all sorts of insecurities and problems, such as not learning to swim until I was in my 30s. And overheating on regular occasion in different sports and just being a runt in general until about sixth grade. So wrestling and the associated weight cutting, which I do not recommend to anyone, it's all dehydration, very bad for you, but offered me an opportunity to harness my obsessive tendencies to actual, some productive outcome. <laughs> and so all the note taking, all the reading, this all came in very handy when I was trying to not kill myself or have my liver fail or my kidneys fail while cutting weight. And that's where a lot of it started because I was the puny kid, but I was the puny kid who now got to wrestle another puny kid, which was great in a weight class based sport. And I was very hyperactive when I was, God, I'd say even three or so. There was the Incredible Hulk, Lou Frigno, remember that? Mm -hmm. Gray hair, why gray hair, I'm not sure. But in any case, I would run into the living room and tear off the cushions of the couch, throw them on the floor, yell like the Incredible Hulk, and then run out of the room. So I was a real handful for my parents from the very get-go. But I think it was the, some of the physical problems that still cause me issues to this day that led to a lot of the experimentation. That makes sense. I, I've always had a theory that every winner is a loser deep down. You know, they, 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 start, they start out as a loser. I'm not saying you're all losers. Naval's here all I'm night. He's winners. here all yeah. night and all week. <laughs> well, deep down, you have to feel like you're a loser. Otherwise, you wouldn't stay in and do the push-ups or read the books or uh, you know, develop the skill or the craft. You just go out and hang out with all the cool kids and, and have a Naval great time. I think Naval is negging me right now. He's <laughs> hitting on me in person. But um, anyway, uh, I I'd, have to, I'd have to get in line if I was one of your groupies. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I mean, I, so this has made you into kind of what I think is sort of this fearless high-speed learning machine. Um, actually, one of our common friends in the audience, uh, who's also our physical uh, trainer, um, he's having more success with you than with me, obviously. Um, <laughs> he basically uh, called you a maven, 
you know, where you learn, you synthesize, you teach, you're this connector of knowledge. Uh, and that, that in itself is, is a form of expertise. So I want to talk a lot about your ability to learn because I think fundamentally this, this as they call cult-like following, so you're all members of a cult now, uh, your, your cult uh, follows you because of what you teach them. And what you teach them is actually how to learn, which is uh, the ultimate meta skill. Um, and so uh, I, I'm, I've always been excited to learn from you. And so I started learning about your, the meta learning, the philosophy of Tim when it comes to learning. And I found this great quote from you that said, if you're reasonably intelligent and organized, you can become world class at one or two things per year, I think. <laughs> the I think is really <laughs> critical. That's called a hedge. Yeah. Continue. That, that made me feel really inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm looking to be world class at one or two things in my life, and yeah. that would be fantastic. Two would be great. That's like two lives. But you have developed systems and methodologies and processes mm -hmm. to get there once or twice a year. Can you talk a little bit about that? How do you pick something new up? How do you approach it? What's the philosophy? How, how much time do you give yourself? I can comment on that. So I would say key number one, pick something really, really, really arcane, like Japanese horseback archery, where there are only seven people in the world <laughs> who practice it. Immediate advantage. Uh, but <laughs> looking more broadly, I, I would say let's define some terms. So for me, world class in this context means something very specific. It means top 5% in the general population. You're not going to be world class, and I feel ex extremely obligated to say this since we have <laughs> Jersey and Aniello, who we were just referring to, world so class, Jersey yeah. and his wife, who both have world records in Olympic weightlifting, to say that five, top 5% five in the general population, not in the competitive population. You're not going to be top 5% in powerlifting, say, in six months. It's just not going to happen, unless you're a complete mutant. Uh, those people do exist. They're very frightening and they annoy me because they have all these incredible attributes. But uh, the very first thing that I ask myself, since I mentioned attributes, is who is good at this, who shouldn't be? Hmm. And that is the common perception. They shouldn't be good at X. And there might be very good reasons why they are, but who, for instance, in the ultra-endurance world is 250 pounds and heavily, heavily muscled or overweight. Hmm. I want to study those people if they're successful because they are using, I assume, training and technique to overcome a lack of God-given attributes that are well suited to the sport. So you don't really believe in genetic mutants as much or you're not trying to emulate the genetic I mutants? I believe in them, but no. I, I think that they will misattribute their success hmm. to things they've learned versus having gigantic webbed feet and the ability right. to dislocate their ankles when they swim, like most Olympic yeah. swimmers, for instance. When you get to that level, they all start to look the same for very good reason. I would rather study someone like Shinji Takeuchi, who learned to swim in about the span of a year and then had the second most popular video on YouTube, second only to Phelps, when Phelps was at his very, very peak because he was so fluid and so exceptional. And that could take many different forms, for instance. And uh, since he's here, I'll point him out. So let's, let's take Jersey as another example. Jersey, how old are you right now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just bringing out the big guns. 62, 63? 62. Okay. So Jersey's 62. Most people, when they get to, say, 30, 40, they're like, ah, oh, you know, when you turn 30, when you turn 40, you just can't wind back the hands of time, man. My joints hurt. I'm not 20 anymore. Can't do anything. All right, so Jersey 62, he can take a loaded barbell on top of an Indo board. This is one of those wobble boards, you know these things? Whip it overhead and drop down, ass to his heels in a perfect snatch position. This is an Olympic position at 62. So <laughs> most people would think that's impossible. And we, both of us, have seen videos of, say, 74-year-olds, I think, that Jersey has trained after they've had hip replacements, dual shoulder replacements to do this, the same thing but on stable ground. I want to study those outliers. So rather than throwing out the outliers and saying, oh, they don't matter because they're anomalies, I want to study them particularly if, say, you have a concentration of anomalies which might be, say, Omaha, Nebraska, and value investors, mm -hmm. or coming out of 
the so-called tiger cubs in the hedge fund world. Or people are trained by Jersey and he's able to replicate his success, which is also indicative of the fact that it's not purely attribute based. That's how I select the people to study and that's always the beginning, is separating skill that you can model from attributes which you cannot. Yeah, so it's separating the naturals from the learned. That's and right. now, how do you immerse with them? How much time do you spend with them? Do you, do you say I'm gonna do two hours a week, four hours a week, eight hours a week for, for two years? Uh, what's that learning curve look like? I will, it depends on time constraints. So I'm a big believer in the power of time constraints, but let's just say I'm preparing for four-hour chef and I'm looking at surfing, which mm -hmm. combines uh, water, <laughs> which I've always been terrified of. But you only have, you have a lung issue, right? I have a left lung issue. My left lung collapsed when I was born and I had to have blood transfusions because I couldn't oxygenate. So I have lung issues to begin with. But uh, in a case like that, <clears throat> I will first say, let's make, make it a really clear example, paddle surfing. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have comfort in water, we have use of paddle, we have surfing technique. We have choice of equipment. I will try to take that particular skill and break it down into as many component pieces as I can. And then I will formulate questions that I can ask experts, ideally people who have succeeded through skill and replicable methods as opposed to just attributes. And I will ask them certain questions about each of these areas, such as what are the, and people who listen to the podcast will recognize some of these questions. So I'll ask them, where do novices waste the most time in X? Hmm. Say, paddling technique. Okay, I will probably get a very clear answer. And I will ask hypothetical questions such as, if you had 12 weeks to prepare me for a competition, and we'll pick a competition so we know what our target is, how would you prepare me if you wanted me to win? You had a million dollar prize on the line. I know it's impossible, but if you had to, what would you do? And that has produced some really phenomenal programs, whether it's Brian McKenzie and prep, say, in the four-hour body. People might have seen the 12-week prep for a marathon. And I've had readers who have reached out and said, I did it in seven or eight weeks. Reminds me a little bit of uh, Miyamoto Musashi, if you remember, uh, Japan's greatest swordsman. I think 92 duels to the death, and he won all of them. And he said very famously, do nothing that is of no use. So you're kind of filtering all of that out at the edges. Oh yeah. And then of course you had to go fight duels to the death, so everything was on the line. Yeah, so Musashi, everybody here should check out Miyamoto, well I guess depending on if you're using the Japanese. Japanese would be Miyamoto Musashi, and there's a, there's a historical novel, so it's fictionalized uh, history, called Musashi, which has sold more than 100 million copies in Japanese. So everybody should take a look at that. It'll give you an appreciation for Musashi, who has a lot in common with, say, a Peter Drucker. Same thing, focusing on being effective, meaning choosing the right things to do before focusing on being efficient. Because you can do really meaningless or unimportant things really, really well, really well. That does not make them important at all. And you see that in every possible skill area where a lot of people get good at things that are the trivial many. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I noticed that all of us have 24 hours in a day, and we all get roughly the same gift in life, which is we get a life. We each get one life worth of time, and yes, the details vary, but we get one life. And what I've noticed is most of us spend a lot of our time reacting. Like, I spend most of my day reacting, going from email to meeting to to-do to task to next thing to next thing to next thing. It's a miracle if I get 20 minutes to reflect during the day. You seem to spend, at least judging by what you say and write, you seem to spend most of your time in meta activities where you're reflecting, you're journaling, you're preparing, you're, you're maybe taking stock of what happened during the day. How much of your time do you think you spend in these meta activities of getting ready to do things and, as opposed to actually doing things? I'd say in the first quarter of each year in particular, it's probably 60% meta. Wow. 60% meta. Everything I did today, with the exception of recording one podcast interview, was meta work. Yeah, I think and I did 10 minutes of meta work today. <laughs> well, now, just in your defense, I would say that uh, anyone who hasn't read this essay, I may get the exact title wrong, but Paul Graham's essay on maker's schedule, manager's schedule, mm -hmm. 
is a must read. And you have a real company to run. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's true. You, so, need, you need large blocks of free time to actually get anything done. So yeah. I, I avoid meetings like the plague. I hate them. Yeah. And I try to set at least two days on my calendar where I have no meetings. And even then, one per day week. Will, per week, yeah. And even then, one will sneak on. Um, and so that one day where I don't have meetings, I'll walk around and get bored. And only when I'm bored can I be creative. Right. No, this is important. To do the deep work, I think you need that slack in the system. And today, for instance, I've been struggling with or debating how to allocate my resources this year. Time, energy, attention, yeah. money, et cetera. And I made a list of assets in different classes. classes. And this doesn't mean liquid assets like real estate. Nothing that contributes directly to my net worth, but just things I have access to, people I have access to, maybe, say, newsletter, podcast, blog, et cetera. And I decided after interviewing Amanda Palmer, I was very <laughs> encouraged to ask for more help in life. What an idea, right? And th I thought of f a handful of different friends who could help me think about where they would allocate these resources if they were in charge of a few different things in my life. And so I made a list of assets, and I, I'm literally sending them today, talking to friends to prep them, and then sending them a list to ask if you were in my shoes, and I lay out a few priorities. Mm -hmm. How would you optimize for X while minimizing, uh, mi minimizing the following things? And I sent it to them. So it, it's, it's a lot of meta work. Hey, you really do outsource a lot of your life to experts. I've noticed even when you call me with a question, it'll always be like very thought out, very methodical. I feel like I'm being grilled in an interview. It's one, <laughs> two, three, four, five. You'll get the answer you want. Uh, you, you'll, you'll get a real answer. You're not just looking for confirmation bias. I'll give you credit on that. Uh, and then you're done, and you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Naval. Checks in the mail. Uh, <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, yeah. but, but <laughs> that you've created for yourself deliberately. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, that Derek Sivers podcast uh, that you did was incredible. The, the hell yes or no, this is a concept where you either really want to do something or the default answer is no. And, and it's a really nice, easy, forward mnemonic. Uh, and it's already changed my life. I use it all the time, internally, of course. Uh, I don't say to people that, no, it's not hell yes, no. so you're a no out. Um, and, th and there's quite a few things like that. One of the things I love about um, your podcast is the pithy wisdom, the way they just synthesize and pull signal out of the noise. Uh, another one uh, that I found recently that you'd written down was no hurry, no pause. And that one, the moment I heard it, it stuck with me. And it's literally it's changed the last few weeks of my life. That one... I'm just an aggregator and a curator. I'm not coming up with any of this stuff, which I enjoy. I'm okay with that job. <laughs> and but there's so little originality anyway. I mean, we're all, true. We're all standing all, on shoulders. It's all recycling right? of some yeah. fashion. So the, the no hurry, no pause comes from Brema, B-R-E-E-M-A, Bodywork, which I believe is based right here in the Bay Area. And I was taught that line, which is one of their principles by Jenny Sauer Klein, who's one of the co-founders of Acro Yoga. And it just was, there was so much profundity and so many far-reaching implications. If you take that, no hurry, no pause. And a really close corollary to that was taught to me by uh, a friend uh, who I just went to uh, what I was calling, in a joking way, misery camp with. <laughs> I think we need more voluntary suffering, by the way. We can get to that, maybe. In any case, a uh, former military guy, and he was explaining how a close cousin of that is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And that's straight from the military. There are a lot of applications of that. But I want to come back to one thing you said, which was that's, a, that's an incredible luxury that you've designed or built. It's, it's in a sense something else as well, and that is a forcing function. It is a, a pre-scheduled event where I'm going to be off the grid, right. I'm socially accountable to other people who invited me and are going. This is very important. Physically, I'm going to be unable to connect in most respects. I'll be in a kayak. Right. And that gives me a very clear deadline by which I need to set things up. So it is, it is a luxury if I pull it off, which I fully intend on pulling off, because I've done this before, and I try to, and I would recommend to everybody in the audience who can make it work. And in, in a venture-backed playing field, it's sometimes very difficult. Mm -hmm. But let's just assume that some of you run bootstrapped companies. You might be the only one. It might be a solar, solar printer shop or a handful. If you schedule a four to eight week period off the grid 
for a vacation and you put it on the calendar, you pay for it. Ideally, you go with someone else or you meet other people so that you have social accountability. You'll be forced to, to create systems and policies that will far outlast the vacation. And then you will come back and you will have improved your business dramatically and you will have simultaneously improved your life dramatically. So I still try to do this because I have to take my own medicine a few times a year uh, to act as that forcing function. You've inspired me. I'm going to schedule a three-month sabbatical right now. <laughs> <laughs> I could be your social accountability. Be like Thelma and Louise. Be that great. That's true. Well, th th that's a very interesting idea, this, this confirmation bias and social accountability. You did this on your TV show where um, this was insane. I actually couldn't watch all the episodes because it was painful. Where you I, would, still have, I still have injuries from the TV well, show. You, you would make some commitment at the beginning, and then six or seven days later, you'd do something completely absurd. So it was like, I, you're going to learn Filipino, the Tagalog, uh, yeah, and yeah, then you'll be interviewed in li live TV seven days later. Yeah, or you're stressful. Gonna, yeah, you're going to learn drumming from scratch, and you're going to play with a band foreigner in front of a giant audience. Yeah. Uh, or what was the parkour one? That one seemed parkour completely insane. Parkour was effectively, how, in how many ways can Tim injure himself? <laughs> That was effectively the TV show. That was atrocious. <laughs> Man. Turns out jumping up on boxes, not the same as jumping off of walls or trees. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was ugly. So well, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing. There's an intense physicality to some of these challenges you take on. Like for me, you know, when I think challenging, like, oh, I've forgotten my math, and I'm going to go read a physics book and see if I can remember math. For you, it's firing guns, jumping off buildings, being attacked by creatures. <laughs> it's almost like a Japanese game show <laughs> where yeah. you're running around. Tim gets chased by Komodo dragons coming so at night. Where's, yeah. Where does that fearlessness for your physical body come from? It's, it's, it's actually exactly the opposite. It is regular dosing with fear. Hmm. And... That's, when, deep. That's a good one. Yeah, Very when I was, it's, it's inoculation with fear. It's like a flu shot. Mm -hmm. I want to engage regularly with things that cause me fear and cause me discomfort in a voluntary way so that when I face involuntary fear or suffering, it, it unbalances my life less. And when you're in one of these situations, do you have some kind of mantra or rule where you're like, I'm just not going to give up at this point. I'm going to make it to a certain point before you even allow yourself to think about, have you ever even thought about giving up inside one of these things? Oh yeah. When I'm getting choked unconscious by <laughs> someone at the Marcelo Garcia <laughs> Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school, I'm not like, just tough it out, man. <laughs> I, I will tap in those scenarios uh, for sure. Uh, there are instances when I will in my advancing years, hopefully developing more wisdom, <laughs> maybe, uh, I will regularly engage with suffering, but try to avoid injury. <laughs> try to avoid injury. I'm getting better at that. What, what are some of your more famous injuries here? Your oh, bigger ones? Oh, God. I mean, I've had 20 or maybe 30 plus fractures. I've had multiple reconstructive surgeries. It's not quite evil Knievel, but it's not desk jockeying either, a uh, lot of really nasty injuries. And bones, I don't mind so much. If those break, that's OK. I mean, they tend to grow back stronger. <laughs> Joints, tendons, ligaments, you don't want to break those things. Uh, I've I broken zero bones in my life, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> but I'm a desk jockey. <laughs> yeah, that's OK. And I think you've done very well for yourself. It's not mandatory that you tear your shoulder out and have it sticking out of your chest. <laughs> like an, one of those creatures from aliens. You don't have to have that experience to be successful in your career. I don't recommend it. Uh, but uh, I, I do think it's possible to suffer with low risk of injury. And th so this is so a second. So cold exposure, yeah. fasting. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet, as I say. So do it with medical supervision. But these types of things, uh, physical hardship, lactic acid, threshold training, I was just, I just spent two days up in the mountains with no tent, no nothing above the snow line with no food, no water, had to find water with someone who was supervising. Uh, but we woke up in the morning and our feet were numb for five hours. That freaked me out a little. <laughs> Couldn't feel my feet. Step 10 toes. It's not a normal experience for me, but didn't get frostbite. All was well, but it felt like I was going to vomit for 24 hours because this guy is a thousand times fitter than I am. And I consider that a win. Wow. So, uh, so there's this theme about uh, voluntary suffering. 
And it seems like we live, our modern lives are very sedentary, they're very safe. Um, it's probably uh, the reason why we have a lot of ailments that maybe weren't around. We've, we've substituted, we've solved some of the acute problems, we've developed chronic problems. Um, so it, it, you, you have this regimen of voluntary suffering. W where do you think we should suffer? What are the different checklists or checkpoints if I wanted to build a suffering calendar <laughs> by Tim Ferriss? That would be a popular holiday gift. Yes, okay. Uh, all right. All the organizers involved, I hope you have good liability insurance. Here goes. Uh, with proper qualified supervision, I think that some form of intermittent fasting, okay. some form of cold exposure. So intermittent fasting, you're talking about 24-hour uh, fasts? Like could once be 24, a week. could be three days, okay. could be longer. Uh, but generally, I've done up to 10. I don't recommend that as a starter 10 kit. Days. 10 days, but just I, water and just why well, I, I this is this gets into more details, but I've done seven day distilled water only. I actually think that is the <sighs> high pain, uh, high unnecessary pain way to approach some of the benefits of fasting. Okay. So there are other approaches, but I would say that I would say any type of intense physical training, uh, particularly something that stresses uh, your metabolic conditioning, so it's high intensity interval training, for instance. Mm -hmm. I did a podcast recently with Dr. Martin Gabala. Like sprints or sports or. Right. Yeah. Anything that makes you want to puke effectively. Okay. So contending with <laughs> nausea. Right. Uh, and uh, uncertainty. Um, subjecting yourself to circumstances where you have uncertainty for a, an undefined period of time. And so, for instance, yeah. I went on this two-day excursion with my friend. No, he's a good friend. He loves subjecting himself to suffering, too, but he, he would kill me if he subjected me to his dosing. And uh, he packed the pack that I was going to take, and we decided that I would only look at the contents of the pack once we got above the snow line to where we were going to camp. <laughs> Uncertainty. And then where we were going to go the next day, what the elevation gain would be, how long we would be out, unknown variable. And so trying to expose myself, it's in, a, in, a, in a, this sounds contradictory, but in a pre-planned controlled fashion to uncertainty, I also find very helpful with mm. then contending with the unknowns. And there's all, there are always so many more unknowns than knowns, which partially explains my, I suppose you would say, compulsion towards Stoic philosophy. And yeah, so, so it, it, it is m more of a mental game than a physical game. Um, I was yeah. commenting earlier that you, you've actually invited me onto two different things, and you know, here I've been reading Tim Ferriss says this, Tim Ferriss says do that, and he makes it look so easy. And then you invited me to Wim Hof's, uh, the, AKA the Iceman, his cold exposure training. And I said, no, no, I don't like cold weather. When there's a beach version, let me know. Uh, and then you invited me to Laird Hamilton's underwater uh, exercise regimen. Yeah. Yeah, where you get into, what is it? You get into a pool, hold your breath, and do, do weights. Weight, weight training underwater. Right? Yeah. So that's not for me either. Because um, <laughs> I don't really swim well. And, well the, uh, the good news is the weights hold you on the bottom. <laughs> no swimming required. Perfect, yeah. yeah. So here I was thinking, well, you know, this is great. I'm just going to wait for that third one that's going to be easy. And then I realized, no, it's, it's not easy. And it's probably never easy for you either. It was never, e and I'm waiting for the easy in, but you somehow just seem to charge right in. And there's a mental preparation for that, a mental fortitude. Um, starting with the Stoics, I know Seneca is your favorite Stoic philosopher, and he has a lot to say on this topic, although I don't think he ever did any of this crazy stuff. But... Yes, uh, Seneca was a controversial character. There's a good essay called The Case of the Opulent Stoic. Very controversial guy. Uh, and I think he would have enjoyed all of the controversy about the apparent contradictions. I think he was a real prankster in a lot of respects. But the, the practice of say, and nowhere is this more obvious than what I'm about to mention, hedonic adaptation than in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. We both know or I've spent time with people who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars who are completely miserable because the person next to them bought a slightly bigger jet and it just eats them. They're just like, oh, they're frenemy that they have to smile at and congratulate for buying the jet and it just kills them. And they're less happy than they were when they were eating ramen and trying to buy used clothing in college. And to counteract that, you can 
schedule hardship, and that hardship could be doing something seemingly, seemingly monotonous, like, all right, you're not good at being bored, okay. Your task, should you choose to accept it, is just like stand on a chair and do nothing for five minutes every morning. <sighs> okay, there you go, hardship. Don't give my wife any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are ways, and Seneca talks about this in, for instance, I think it's letter 13 of the Moral Letters to Lucilius, which you can find on public domain. I, I loved it so much uh, that I did. Actually, uh, Tim had all of Seneca's letters turned into this amazing audiobook podcast, uh, which I download and listen to practically every day when I work out, and they're incredible. Those are life-changing. I listen to them when I'm, when I'm walking around. In the mornings or otherwise, they tend to be very short. But letter 13, I think it's on, let's see, it's on feasts and festivals, something along those lines. And he talks about setting aside a certain number of days, say each month, where you will eat the, effectively the cheapest of food, wear the cheapest of clothing, mm -hmm. lay on a hard surface, sleep on a hard surface, and ask yourself all the while, is this the condition that I so feared? So not only does the the voluntary suffering or hardship inocul inoculate you against future hardship, not only does it make you happier with what you have because you're not just s having your set point go higher and higher and higher through this hedonic adaptation, it counterbalances that, it is also helping you to fear less the worst case scenario. So it gives you the boldness to take what other people perceive as risks. I don't view myself as a risk taker, oddly enough. I view myself as first and foremost a, a risk mitigator. It's funny, all, the, the, all entrepreneurs say that too. They say the, the good entrepreneurs like uh, Richard Branson, he says, I don't take risk in my businesses. Same with Ted Turner. Yeah, it's the same. I mean, people think of Richard Branson, like he, he plays the part and he yeah. has the crazy hair and he's doing the jet skiing and not the jet skiing, the kite surfing with like a naked model on his back. <laughs> oh my God, Richard Branson, <laughs> that guy's crazy. But he's not crazy. When he started Virgin Atlantic, first thing he did is an experiment when a, one of his uh, connecting flights was delayed and he found a charter plane and he walked around with a piece of paper with Virgin Airlines <laughs> trying to book seats. He booked seats. Like, ah, oh, maybe there's something to this. And then he called, I think it was Boeing, to figure out how to structure a creative lease so that he could return the plane if it didn't work out. Hmm. From the very nice. outset, how do I cap my downside? And I think that the scary things become far less scary when you realize, Kevin Kelly is another good example. He has done a lot of backpacking, continues to travel in very thrifty ways, even though he can afford to do things that are much more expensive. This is the founding editor of mm -hmm. Wired Magazine, arguably the world's real most interesting man, just a fascinating guy. Mm -hmm. And he's done so much backpacking that he's like, well, worst case, sleeping bag, eat oatmeal a bunch. It's not that bad, totally fine. When, I, when I heard that Seneca uh, letter, I had some vision of you lying on the floor of your house uh, sleeping on a cardboard box and eating out of the dog bowl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once a week, just yeah, to, yeah. for Com stoic coming, training. Coming to Instagram soon, so <laughs> keep, keep posted. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Seneca uh, letters have just been a great gift, by the way. Um, and uh, it's amazing. Seneca, not only did he have so much wisdom, but he knew exactly how much wisdom he had. He even said to Lucilius, I'm going to make you famous just by addressing you in these letters. <laughs> People will remember you a thousand years from now. And he was right. What's, um, what's very... So thanks for making me famous, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think people need to hear what you have to say. And so, I mean, when I put together the Tao of Seneca, that audiobook collection, yeah. I also wanted people to learn about the art and craft of persuasion and rhetoric in the most constructive sense. And uh, I'll give you an example. The way that Seneca tries to convert Lucilius or convince him to listen to him is by taking the best parts of his opposing school in some respects. Mm -hmm. So Epicureanism, Epicurus, so Epicurus, yeah. and he would say, he would often open or close with something very powerful from Epicurus because he knew- Every, every time. He knew every Lucilius time, yeah. was a big fan. And he's like, well, if I want to convert him to my side, let me use that as the Trojan horse. And that is an incredibly powerful device and approach if you have any, if you want to persuade in any respect. Yeah. Uh, I think this country could certainly use that right now. <laughs> oh, he's very, very smart, always using the other side um, to make his arguments. Um, Which, by the way, Darwin did when he wrote Origin of Species. Uh, very good 
at, I guess what Sam Harris would call steel manning, instead of straw manning, he would take, he would take the potential opposition's viewpoint and strengthen it, make it as credible and powerful as possible and put it into his writing so that he could then address it preemptively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and steel man instead of straw man. Mm -hmm. It's intellectually a lot more honest. Um, and when you talk about hedonic adaptation, it's sort of, uh, I, I absolutely see that too. And, and it happens to me too, it happens to all of us. We get older in life, we figure out more what we want, we get more of the material things that we chased and we just don't end up happy having those things. And um, at least what I've noticed is that I hedonically adapt to anything man-made. I tend not to hedonically adapt to natural things. Mm. So I don't hedonically adapt to food or sex or a beautiful view or um, you know, uh, to the endorphins you get from a great workout. But I'll very quickly hedonically adapt to material possessions and money and even status and those kinds of things. Um, and I think in that way, nature has a way of reminding us who's in charge uh, yeah. and where true happiness comes from. Well, when I did a retrospective look at my 2016 calendar, so this is what I do before, around January 1 for the last few years, and I went through 2016 calendar and I asked myself, I went through week by week and I asked, this is the 80-20 as always, I have to bring it up every time I talk, here we go. So what are the 20% of activities and engagements and people who produced 80% or more of my peak emotional experiences, positive emotional experiences, and then conversely the 20% that did the opposite. And I tried to find the patterns within the positive so that I could pre-schedule those. And it was intense physical exertion mm -hmm. uh, in a natural setting for at least a week. And so I've gone out of my way to try to schedule skiing, acro yoga, the kayaking, right. and Grand Canyon, and so on. And you're a big fan of even barefoot walking around outside. Yeah, I try to walk barefoot when I can. Uh, I have a lot of feet issues that I'm working on, um, but I think that a lot of our problems are solved just by walking around on grass barefoot <laughs> every once in a while, so pretty simple. And you, you went all the way. You even ha had a big uh, struggle with Lyme disease that you acquired out in nature. I did, yeah. So, uh, warning, if you decide that one of the ways you want to walk around on grass is to get archery tag bows, so these are... These are bows and arrows that have foam-tipped arrows, so you can then put on a paintball mask and hunt your friends, and they can hunt you, like Hunger Games. So I got really into this at one point. <laughs> it's awesome. It's so great. And I decided, you know what? If I ever decide to hunt deer with a bow and arrow, I should practice, and I don't want to maim any deer. There are a lot of deer on Long Island. So I decided to walk around barefoot with archery tag, bow and arrow, trying to get deer in the, in like the wilderness of Long Island. <laughs> and uh, you, you invited me to this and I refused. Yeah, and, I, <laughs> and, I, and I noticed two things really quickly. Number one, you're never going to hit a deer. It's just like, <laughs> boop, and it, the, you, they, they fly no more than about 25 feet, and the deer are way too smart. Gives they're you a lot of like, respect like, for the old hunters. Really? <laughs> What are you thinking? And second, you're absolutely going to come back with like a thousand ticks on you. And so I ended up getting bitten six times and uh, taking off six embedded ticks in about t three days. And I was like, okay, I think enough foam arrow hunting of deer at this point. And then had the Lyme disease. And after the antibiotics and so on, which I think are very important, the ketogenic diet. And I, I still don't have a mechanistic, a really great mechanistic explanation for why this is the case, but it alleviated almost all of the cognitive and physical symptoms that I experienced. And you're insane on the self-measurement side, like the level to which you, how many blood tests do you do? I do a lot of blood tests, <laughs> uh, but I, I would say that in, at any given point in time, unless I have a very, very intense physical goal, I'm not actively tracking and tweaking many things at all. Okay. Uh, but when I get blood tests, I get the Cadillac treatment because I feel like I should take, I don't have a car, I haven't had a car for a few years, but if you, if you are getting your car checked more often than you're getting blood tests, you need to rearrange your priorities. And if you're like, what, a thousand dollars? It's like, yeah, a thousand right. bucks. Like don't get the junior varsity version of the blood tests. And uh, Yeah, there are incredible tools out there now for it. Yep. Uh, the online tools, the blood tests you can order yourself are actually better than what your doctor will give you. And it's more better interpreted and I'm not saying don't use your doctor, obviously. Yeah, use your doctor, yeah. but ask your doctor to trend and not just look at snapshots. This is really important. I know a lot of friends 
who live in this area, mm -hmm. who say get a blood test once a year, and they don't standardize anything. So they might have one test on a Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, and then the next one they do a year later is Monday morning at eight o'clock after a week of binging on alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, uh-oh, your cholesterol's high, your testosterone's low. Here's a pill, here's a prescription, here's another cream. And all of a sudden they're on this weird, in this case, say unnecessary maintenance regimen that they didn't need a corrective regimen. So if you talk to your doctor, but always ask for trending and always ask to replicate results. There are a lot of false positives and false negatives in blood testing. Labs have trouble all the time. This happens consistently. So I would just say, find a doctor who is willing to trend. So where do you come out on supplements then? I've seen you recommend, uh, I would say, more natural kind of supplements, but where do you, like how many pills a day? <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. I, there are a lot of people out there who are really prescribing a lot of supplements these yeah, days. Yeah, I think that supplements should be supplements, not primary. So if you're doing a mediocre job in your diet and then relying on supplements, you're doing it in a haphazard way that I think can backfire. Because humans, well, let me take a step back. Doctors, if they're honest, and this is a common expression, will say 50% of what we know is wrong, we just don't know which 50%. Mm -hmm. And we know very little about how certain, say, foods are constituted, how they act in the human body. And there are many, there are hundreds of examples of this. Carrots are good for your eyesight. Oh, we think it's beta carotene. Let's isolate that. And then people take mega doses of beta carotene to develop all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, no, nature did not intend you to mega dose beta carotene. So whenever possible, I try to get my nutrients from whole food sources. Because I, I don't think we even have the tip of the iceberg in terms of knowledge of what is in these foods or how they certainly interact with other foods and within the body. Uh, but supplements these days, uh, I take a handful. I'm experimenting with a few. Uh, N-acetylcysteine, so NAC, mm -hmm. which can be very useful if you end up tired and wired. So if, you are, if you're waking up or have a hard time getting to sleep because your glucose is very high, then this can blunt cortisol. You can you look it up on PubMed, which I think is a good resource. Uh, very low dose uh, lithium orotate, mm -hmm. which I've written about in Tools of Titans. Powerful, powerful stuff, but you can get over-the-counter dietary supplements versions that have, say, five milligram doses. Versus, if you're using it as a monotherapy for other conditions like uh, bipolar or depression, it might be in the 1200 to 1500 milligram range. Keeping in mind, I'm not a doctor, so talk to mm -hmm. your professional. But uh, otherwise, I've minimized a lot. I've really tried to minimize. There are a handful of things I take here and again. Took some caffeine anhydrous with L-theanine about an hour and a half ago, so I could be as, as you know, I have a modicum of personality while I'm here in front of you guys. Uh, but probably should add more wine. I yeah, I'll give, <laughs> I'll give you credit for not turning your franchise into a giant store for supplements. <laughs> well, you know, on that point, uh, it, it's, I made a very deliberate choice, for instance, when the 4-Hour Body came out or pre-4-Hour Body to not launch my own company at the same time. I could have made tens of millions of dollars, and I know that business inside and out. I absolutely could have made tens of millions of dollars yeah. with my own products, but I didn't want people to question as they should in such a case, mm -hmm. my motives for making any of the recommendations. I think that's right. I, I, I followed some great people on uh, blogs and Twitter, and the moment they start selling supplements, I sort of know that I can't really trust what they're saying as much anymore. Yeah, you gotta be careful. You always watch the incentives. That's, I think, a good rule for life. Watch the incentives. So in five minutes, we're gonna move to uh, Q&A, uh, and there'll be people coming around with mics. So uh, in five minutes, you'll raise your hand and, and you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, we're gonna ask you to keep the questions succinct and in incisive. We're not looking for your life biography. We're not looking for you to make a statement. We're just looking for you to ask a question to Tim, and I'm gonna have to unfortunately enforce that. So please keep that in mind. Um, I do want to get to the really good stuff, which is the secret <laughs> uh -oh. life of Tim Ferriss. Oh boy! Um, you know, <laughs> sounds like a Disney movie. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I, I'm sure your days are not perfect. They're not super glamorous necessarily. You probably have a lot of lazy days where you oversleep. Uh, you know, one of the things that we, yeah. that we don't know about Tim, I'll start with one. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. um, Tim has a, has a new dog, Molly. Mm -hmm. Uh, very sweet dog, uh, incredibly well trained, uh, far better trained than probably even more work has gone to training Molly than unfortunately my kid will even get out of me. <laughs> but um, we, we took a trip recently. We went down to uh, meet with Jersey and Anya and uh, it was a it was two or three hours away from home, and Tim insisted on bringing Molly. <laughs> so I had to drive in, and we had to load Molly in the car, make sure she was comfortable, take her down. She hung around, played with the cat, and then we brought Molly back. So I, th I thought that was very sweet. That was a very unexpected Tim. What are the other such uh, things that we'd be surprised to find out about you? Well, let me comment on the Molly, uh, the Molly decision for a second. So I put off getting a dog for a very, very long time as an adult. I grew up with dogs. I feel somewhat incomplete without a dog in my life. But I, I always had a reason not to do it. Always had a reason not to do it. And I think for arguably for all the most important things in life, you always have a lot of reasons not to do them. Right. And you have to find the reasons to do them. And then one by one, in some cases, decide that you will figure out how to address the others. And for me, one of them was travel. I travel too much. And I'm always, say, taking Ubers here and there and other places. And I just made the commitment that if I were to get a dog, I would have her with me as often as possible and take her with me. And if that incurred cost, if that incurred headache, so be it, because she didn't ask to be adopted by me. I chose to adopt her, and therefore it's my obligation. But other things people would not know about me Let's see, uh, when I'm really stressed out, one thing I like to do to alleviate stress, which can freak people out all over the place, especially in San Francisco, there's so many crazy people here, is, is I'll stretch my jaw, and so I'll just walk around and go, <laughs> like in the airport, and, and mothers are like, oh God, I like pushing their kids to the side. Airports are not a good place to behave weird. No, right <laughs> no, no. I have a checkered, checkered pass with the TSA for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> Nothing ominous, just like stupid behavior. Oh, my, that's my starter pistol. What do you mean? Oh, well, great. Oh, that's my unlabeled bag of yerba mate from South America. And they're like, come with us, please. There, there was a time when you had quite the firearm collection. Was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I still do have quite yeah. the firearm collection. That makes me popular in San Francisco, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, I think my I, first Tim Ferriss outing was shooting at the range. Yeah, that's right. And, that's uh, right. I, yeah. I, was, I remember being impressed not only by how many firearms you had or how large they were, but how there was one for every occasion and they were within reach <laughs> and you could do this and one would pop it was out. It like one, one for Valentine's yeah. Day, one for bar mitzvahs. <laughs> you know, I have, I have a number of side gigs. <laughs> So before we go to Q&A, we want to we wanna make sure that everybody here gets what they came for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the really impressive thing about your audience is this is not an audience of followers, it's an audience of leaders. Um, and after having been in your podcast, um, I got this huge wave of followers who were very impressive people. My previous huge wave of followers came from when Justin Bieber followed me <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> And I got a lot of very confused and angry people <laughs> um, who stayed on my Twitter account for a while before I finally managed to get rid of them, to shed them through the right combination of tweets. Um, but in your case, the followers who came on were incredible people. I mean, these are all, every single one of them, they're running a business, they're doing something in nutrition, they're incredibly into fitness. Uh, and I started following them back and learning from them. Um, so I think... What they are all coming from is for learning, right? What are, what are ideas and things that are gonna change their lives? And obviously, you've been very, very good about communicating all that. You've written it all down. Uh, but what's kind of your more, most recent one? What's the one where you feel like your life is starting to change because of something new that you would encourage everybody in the audience who's, in, who's interested in self-improvement to try, to kind of you know, give up their preconceived notions and try something new that's really made a big difference for you in the last few years? Uh, what's, what's made, the first thing that comes to mind came up in some respects in the B.J. Miller interview that I did, who's a palliative care physician based here in the Bay Area, triple amputee from an electrocution accident in college, rides a motorcycle, so what's your excuse? <laughs> Has helped more than a thousand people to die, and I was asking him if he had someone in his hospice care who didn't really want to interact with other patients for whatever reason. 
what would he give them if he were to give them three things? And he mentioned a comedy, plenty of space and time for just staring ahead and thinking, and then a book of Mark Rothko paintings. And for those who don't know, <laughs> Mark Rothko paintings are colored squares, generally, that sell for $80, $100 million. <laughs> Very abstract. In the wrong business. And, <laughs> and I asked him why, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he, he talked about encouraging people to find beauty in the meaningless and the purposeless. Because there's so much angst and so much depression, I think, caused by focusing on these huge existential questions that may not be good questions in the first place. At the very least, they're probably nearly impossible to answer. Why me? Why now? What happens after this and so on? And so he, he really mentioned a few different instances of, of encouraging people to find beauty in something that could be meaningless. And that sounds depressing, but I've really thought about this a lot. And it has helped me to try to celebrate the small things. And I've realized more and more that as a type A personality, which I certainly am, you think you're going to be able to take a break and you need to put in your effort and work really hard. And all that's true if you're on the right things, but that you maybe don't want to reward yourself until you have a, hit a huge milestone. And then you'll celebrate. But if you don't practice on the little things, you're never going to be able to do that with the big things. And that's true in sharing your emotions with people you care about. It's true with celebrating your wins. It's true with so many aspects of life. So I've, I've really tried to, through the lens almost, of appreciating what seems meaningless and finding beauty in it, to practice those small things. And it's helped me to do a lot of big things and to appreciate them more. So I'd say that is, is really one that comes to mind. And, uh, so the man who can do anything wants to appreciate beauty in the mundane. Beauty in the mundane and absurdity. Those are my, beauty and absurdity are my two directives for 2017 because I've found that also if I'm trying to have a breakthrough, which doesn't mean doing anything bigger necessarily, but just thinking differently and fracturing the cosmic egg as it were uh, and sort of being able to look through all these assumptions and false constructs that I have, that trying to think different or think absurd is often more helpful than trying to think bigger. All right, Tim, we've gotten through 10% of what I have, so <laughs> unfortunately we're running short on time. Uh, absurdity reminds you of your absurd questions uh, track. We haven't even talked about your journaling habit. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot more we could talk about, but we should open it up to the audience, uh, give everyone a chance for Q&A. Remember, please keep it pithy, concise, no life biographies, no speeches. We're just looking for questions. So uh, raise your hand, and uh, someone will come to you with a microphone. And if you are lucky enough to get a microphone, then go ahead and ask your question, please. Hi. Uh, over here on your left. OK. Great. There Hello. we go. Oh, I'm not sure. Can we turn up the house lights a little bit, please? Possible, just so we can see folks. But I'm, I'm happy to talk into the darkness until we yeah. get the house lights up. I can hear you. Uh, when writing, what... <laughs> Wow, was that a really sharp voice change? Or... <laughs> you know, I uh... just get two people. One was me. Oh, 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 yeah. oh I see, I see, all right, all right. It's <laughs> um... <laughs> like the pit of despair. That's a <laughs> Princess Bride reference, okay. <laughs> When writing, what is your order acti of activities? Such as, do you outline? Do you share your ideas with people before you write a draft? My writing process. Uh, order of activities, like, you know, kind of the writing process from, no. would you share an idea before you write a draft? And then write a draft and then edit a draft and then share that draft with other people? Sure. Yeah, my general, I'll try to keep my answer fairly short. I find that there are, there are few ways that I can make my writing easier for me and I think more digestible for readers. One is thinking modular. So I'm going to address this in a slightly different way. So I think of each chapter as a feature magazine article. Start to finish, it is not dependent on other chapters. That's number one, which allows you to write out of order if you get stuck. and also allows readers to read out of order. So I think in that way. And then I always try, because it helps me conceptually, to structure my books in three or four sections. 
and that helps me to slot and just mentally organize things. Scrivener as a program is very helpful for this. So I do all my research and gathering in Evernote, and then I port it over to Scrivener, uh, where I can split windows and, and work in that fashion. I will very often draft by hand first, and then I will revise. Uh, I will then type a first draft, revise by hand, and then share that draft with a handful of different people, and I will ask them, which 10% would you absolutely keep? And if you had to, which 10% would you cut if you had to cut? And in the beginning, I don't care if people like it or dislike it. I care about being clear. So I'll ask them to highlight anything that is unclear or confusing. And those are the most important steps for me in the beginning. There's also uh, one of Tim's uh, podcast guests, is Scott Adams, the yeah. author of Dilbert, uh, brilliant guy. He has a great post. It's a short blog post called The Day You Became a Better Writer. Uh, just Google it. Uh, you talk about it in the podcast as well. He has great advice on persuasive business writing. It's a good piece. We have a question here on your right. Okay. Hi. Okay, so I want to know how you identify human, how you identify trends and human insight. So, are you following Cal Fussman with the idea that all the good <laughs> sticks, or is there a software program that you're using other than Evernote to go back and really find trends? I don't think a lot about trends, to be honest. Uh, I do look for patterns, but those patterns might not have any trending aspect to them. So the, the, in other words, the pattern, if I were to look at, say, search terms for uh, X, it may not be increasing over time, the volume on, say, Google. But I do look for patterns. So I think more about patterns than trends. And to find those patterns, I very often rely on other people. So I will ask, I will ask the experts about recent developments I will ask them about, say, uh, controversial trainers. Who is controversial but really good? Why are they controversial? What do you think about them? And then I'll reach out to that person, and I will try to assess if they can replicate their results. And it's generally on a very small scale, so it might only be a sample size of, say, 10 or 20 people, or athletes, investors, whatever it might be. Uh, I don't think a lot about trends because I, I, I feel like if you can easily identify a trend and you're trying to capitalize on that trend, you're too late. Which is why, for instance, if you're reading Barron's or watching Mad Money for your investment advice. <laughs> They're not giving you the best stock tips. <laughs> like you, you're, you're, you're immediately in a crowded trade position. Right, and for, for that reason, uh, I, don't, I don't think a lot about trends. For instance, in the investment world, although I haven't been involved for a very long time, I would get asked this a lot, like, what's next? Should we focus on VR with this, this, and this type of hardware? Or what do you think about mobile X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, I have no idea. I just know what annoys me and like, what frustrates me, and I'm like, God damn it! And then I find somebody who solves it, and I'm like, yes! I will pay you to build that because this thing annoys me so much. Like that's about as sophisticated as my investment. I, I think your best work is timeless, not trendy. Yeah, um, yeah. So you can create the trend. But yeah. So I, I am yeah. also. And this will be the last bit. I'm trying to pay attention to the old as much as possible. So books that have survived for hundreds or thousands of years, as opposed to the neomania, as Nassim Taleb would would call it. So I, that may be an unsatisfactory answer, but <laughs> I don't think about trends very much. Question upstairs to your right. I brought my own light. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Hi. Uh, you wrote a blog on hacking Kickstarter a few years back, which I used to raise money to donate a sculpture to a museum, which is great. Congrats. I'm about I'm about to uh, launch a new uh, sculpture-related product, and I was wondering if you had any updates to that or how to best succeed in that in that framework. Yeah, the, I don't have many updates to the, the Kickstarter post. It's been very, very successful. A lot of people, I'm just staring up there because I assume maybe you're up there. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot doing, of I'm doing that like Obama look off into the future thing. Uh, <laughs> so I did ask for some updates from Mike Del Ponte, who wrote that post uh, of Soma Water, a very cool company that I'm involved with. 
And I, I do have a few pages in Tools of Titans about that, but I would say the, the most counterintuitive piece, perhaps, that a lot of people don't realize is that you can modify the bit.ly URL, that is the share URL, for almost any Kickstarter page to look at their analytics and to see where they're getting traffic from. This is very, very valuable. So you can find similar products, similar campaigns, and see where they're pulling their traffic from. And this helps you to target, say, writers, bloggers, and so on, who may also give you coverage. Uh, but the general approaches, I think, are largely the same. I don't think they've changed all too much. Uh, there are some new virtual assistant companies that I can't recall offhand, but are mentioned in Tools of Titans. And those would be the only updates that uh, come to mind right away. Bless you. <laughs> Next question. Hi, uh, we have a question on your left. I have a question about um, the next book. You've covered our body, you've covered our productivity and our s success. Um, when are you going to cover relationships? <laughs> 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 This is a great question, and I'll give you a very disappointing answer. <laughs> I really only try to write about things that I feel like I have figured out. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to be yet another armchair quarterback who's like, let me tell you the solution to all of your relationship problems. And meanwhile, like all hell is breaking loose in my own life. <laughs> I'm not saying that's the case right now. I'm actually. Uh, my, my close relationships have never been better, uh, but uh, I, I might, might be able to write about family relationships. In terms of significant other relationships, marriage, kids, all of that, I just don't have much of a track record to point to uh, <laughs> at this point in the marriage kids department. However, uh, I am putting together a, at least one, maybe two podcast episodes that talk about parenting specifically, so I'm pulling from many, you know, dozens of these interviews to pull out the parenting advice, which I think simultaneously acts as relationship advice. They're very intertwined. So that is coming. But it won't come from me, it'll come from my guests. <laughs> Dog, dogs are good right. training. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here on your right. Here on my right, here on my right. Okay. <laughs> can, we, can we turn up the uh, lights a little bit more? I apologize. Guys, that would be great. You know what? I can hear you, so I'm yeah, just going to... Yeah, we can gonna, hear you just fine. I'm just going to Professor X this one. Go for it. Oh, there you are. All right. Go ahead. Gotcha. <laughs> hey, Tim. This is Ben. Uh, big fan of yours. Really happy to see you here. Um, thanks for sharing your insights. I, I would like to piggyback on what Navo said before about uh, be, behind every winner, there's a loser, right? So got to go back to that. And I felt like you appreciated you're very successful today. But what, in one of your podcasts, you share a very dark period of your life. Um, perhaps um, I don't want you to visit that, but the you know after depression uh, that you, you passed through, you, you mentioned in one of the podcast with Jim Fadiman about uh, potentially using microdosing and LSD or psilocybin in, uh, in clinical research. Mm -hmm. um, wondering if you still have an interest in that uh, in that field, and um, appreciate that you may not be able to come in publicly, but uh, we are in San Francisco, um, <laughs> <laughs> so why not? We're also on radio and Facebook Live. Oh, yeah, like who's, <laughs> who's, who's watching? I, I'll talk publicly. So I do have uh, an extreme interest in the neglected applications of psychedelic compounds to many different things, not just depression and anxiety, although there are studies. Some of you may have seen some media coverage in the New York Times recently looking at end-of-life anxiety in cancer patients and the use of psilocybin. There is a book that just came out, and there have been a number of pieces written about, I believe it's Ayelet Waldman, if I'm getting that right, about LSD microdosing and how it affected her marriage, among other things. I wrote a book about this. And uh, I feel very strongly that these compounds have been neglected for political, not scientifically defensible reasons. And they're very, very, very powerful, appear to be very powerful in a number of domains, including addiction. Uh, whether that's opiate addiction, and we have, let's just call it 22, 23 veteran suicides a day, but a third of those are associated with opiate addiction. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I have taken a lot of my energy and funds that were 
being directed into startups and redirected those over the last few years into supporting places like Johns Hopkins, UCSF, and others who are conducting good <laughs> studies and uh, really stand a chance of making these compounds better understood and also more widely available with me proper medical supervision. So I'm very, very interested in all of this. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for doing that. And I, uh, you also had a great podcast with, uh, I think it was Dr. Martin Polanco and Dr. Dan Engel. Dan Engel. Yeah, and the treatment they're doing for war veterans and for addicts yep. um, for, uh, and for depression um, using, using plant medicines, essentially, as they called them in the podcast. Yeah, it's, um, it's highly recommend word. that everybody here listen to that one because it'll, it'll change your perspective. Uh, we use the word drugs to apply to any substance that's bioactive in the brain uh, and that will change our moods. Uh, and that's a very broad brush. And now what we're seeing, for example, with cannabis and so on, the society's changing its views on this stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, who needs drugs? <laughs> <laughs> LSD was uh, originally going to be one of the steps in Alcoholics Anonymous. And oh. uh, didn't quite make it to yeah. the final draft, but <laughs> you can look up the origins of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, it's, it's come full circle and people are revisiting that. You know. We're upstairs again on your right. You, you, thanks, Tim. There's a great program so far. Um, when you, you master so many things, and when you completely master something, do you feel like you need to shed that to move on to the next thing and, and not look back? So if you're, you know, um, spending, all the, spending a year learning how to do horseback archery, do you not go back to that thing, or do mm -hmm. you just have to move on and get to the next stage of mastery? Yeah, your horseback archery skills are atrophying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have lapsed a little in my horseback archery training. Turns out that it's hard to find a venue for that in the Bay Area. <laughs> uh, airport. Yeah, airport. <laughs> Make, yeah, <laughs> improve my relationships with the TSA even further. Uh, who's like, there's a guy on a horse shooting, what? <laughs> so. I would say a few things. Number one, I don't consider myself a master in many things at all. Uh, the, the one skill that I think I do and have focused on mastering is the meta-learning. So I do carry that from one to the next. So the approach that I took with, say, the horseback archery has been refined and then applied to, say, paddle surfing. That is then replied, uh, refined and applied to Turkish and so forth and so on. So that is the constant. And then I would say Cal Fussman came up earlier when he lost boxes and boxes of notes on a feature story for Esquire, and uh, uh, he was given the advice from a novelist, the good <laughs> sticks. Like, you will remember what is most important and salient, and I find that to be true with skills. So the things that really grab me and are going to stand a chance of some type of persistence in my life tend to just come back. And uh, there are many examples of that, whether it's different forms of dance, acro yoga, uh, the writing for that matter, writing is a great example, mm -hmm. podcast, another example. So these, these tend to, it's easier for me to do them than to not do them. They scratch an itch that I need to scratch. But otherwise, I would say I don't consider myself a master. I am very good at helping people to find the minimal effective dose for getting to say the top 5% in the general population. But the true masters, I would say, are people like Jersey and Aniela or Josh Waitzkin, for instance. He's, he is exceptionally good at kind of the last 1%. And so they're complementary skill sets, but uh, the, the meta learning would be the one major constant. We have a question Let's on your left. I think we have time for one more question. So this is gonna be the last one. So I hope it's great. I feel so lucky. <laughs> no pressure. This is amazing. <laughs> Uh, just so you know, Tim, it's been on my bucket list to have a conversation with you, and so I'm hitting that tonight, so I'm super <laughs> stoked. But um, That's not a question. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. It's okay. That's a statement, Sorry, and I did break the rules, so I apologize. But no. uh, you talk about Slim Barris in your book, and um, you reference psychedelics as a tool to help correct problems. What are some of the problems that Slim Barris has solved with psychedelics? Some of the problems that Tim Ferriss has solved with psychedelics. Uh, first, thanks for coming. It's so good to meet you. I'll I'm going to have one more topic for you before sure. you can run off stage. All right. but yeah, I will, I'm always hesitant. Let me just provide a caveat here. I'm always hesitant to answer this. I will because I worry about people being cavalier and very foolhardy with psychedelics. I view them as extremely powerful and they can do a lot of damage if misused. 
a lot of damage. I've seen people exacerbate schizophrenia and go off the deep end. Like you can really do a lot of damage if you're not supervised. I, and I would also say that psychedelics have not 100% fixed any significant problem in my life. What they have done is provided me with the ability, in some cases, to revisit traumatic experiences that I had forgotten and recontextualize those as an adult or to see through any type of armor I'd developed at the problem behind the problem behind the problem. Because very often what we think is our problem is not our problem at all. <laughs> you have to go a few layers deeper. And that has then given me homework assignments in effect. I've known what the next steps are, but without taking those next steps, I think the, the value is very limited. So personally, I would say that Everyone in this audience probably has a reactive emotion that is dominant. Maybe that's sadness, maybe that is depression, maybe it is anger. For me, anger was very frequently my response. I was very impatient, I'm still impatient. <laughs> but uh, I found that it had become very corrosive and I'd had a lot of that pent up since a very young age and I won't bore you with all the reasons, but I was able to, I think, really reduce the symptoms of that by 80, 90%. And that has had very far-reaching consequences. And uh, some of my experiences then combined with doing exercises from people like Tony Robbins, as one example, like the Dickens process, uh, then helped me to have tough conversations with people I care about, the most important conversations. And that was also informed by being exposed to The Tail End, an essay by Tim Urban that everyone should read, The Tail End, read it which was recommended to be by Matt Mullenweg. So all of those factors and confluence have helped me to get to a point where I feel like I was given new homework assignments, I gathered tools, like the five minute journal, for instance, that have allowed me to come to a place, and you know, knock on wood, cross my fingers, where I, I feel more at peace than I've ever felt. And happiness is fleeting, it comes and goes, but I, I really feel better in my own skin, I think, than I ever have. And that has allowed me in feeling at peace to be more honest with people I care about so that they can become more at peace. So I view that as extremely, extremely crux in my entire life. So that would be, that'd be the primary. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question, uh, which is an informed tradition here. Uh, I'd like to ask all the speakers, what is your 60 second idea to change the world? 60 seconds. 60 second idea to change the world is one, buy coffee for a person behind you in line tomorrow. Two, uh, whenever you are about to engage in a fight online or in person, uh, ask questions to identify common ground with the other person. And then third would be identify someone you would never normally talk to and go up and introduce yourself and say hi. I don't think it needs to be more complicated. It's great, it's simple but profound. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.